Hello. I'm just connecting the class. Hello, everybody. This How are you? Is being recorded. Okay. Good to see everyone again. Just want to do a quick double check. Do we have audio? Is everyone able to hear? Yes. Okay. Well, I guess class starts. So today we're going to be talking about calculus. But before I go there, I just want to first double check. I had set something up with groups uh, where people are able to do their homework with groups, groups of people, which are like three people, four people, five people. Were people able to find their groups? Did this thing work well? Yeah? Okay. My hope, again, with the Putnam class is to make something that's not onerous. It's not supposed to be a burden. Instead, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a way to meet interesting people and work on questions together. And so I felt, you know, if we make some groups, it'll be fine. So then I said, okay, great idea. And it looks like we're using Canvas. And Canvas even has a function to make groups. So I said, this is great. This is going to be easy. So I went to that thing, and it said, how many people do you want in each group? And it, I, I picked four. I thought that was reasonable. And out popped groups, where some of the groups had three people, some had four, and some had five. Now this I don't quite understand. I'll, I'll say like, if I had seen that the outcome was groups of size three or four, I know what's going on, you, you know, you kind of rounded down if you had to. If you saw groups, groups of size four or five, then presumably they added one to various groups. I see no reason why a software should produce groups of size three, four, and five if you request four, but try as I might, I couldn't get my way around that. So it might be that your group only has three, might be your group has five, but in any case, it was just supposed to be light anyway. Okay. Well, today we're going to talk about some questions on the, on the field of calculus, and uh, hopefully this will be interesting to think about, as well as hopefully they'll be interesting for you to think with other people about too. So let me now go to the questions. Just a second, I need to link this up to the questions. Good. Okay, questions. All right, so today we're going to be talking about calculus, and I want to actually start with, I want to start with a question which is uh, maybe something that sounds kind of realistic in the sense that someone might care to find the answer to this. And this is question number two. Question number two just says, we have a spherical shell, radius is one. And that's, by the way, the set of points for which x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to one. And the question is simple to state. What's the average straight line distance between two points of the set? So it's just like I've got a sphere, and I pick two random points on the surface of the sphere. What's the average straight line distance? So uh, as usual, if you want to put an answer out, please type into the chat, raise hand, and then I'll start collecting some answers. Just do raise hand. Oh, yes, OK, so Adavit Nini. Uh, could you just fix? One of the points and then bury the other guy. Okay, so this sounds like a good way to start. What you're saying is that I need to pick two points. Two is too many, one is a lot better. So let's just go and suppose that I have a sphere. And if you have the sphere, spheres look sort of like this. You will already say that one of the points is here. I'll just choose the North Pole because it feels right. That's one of the points. And the other point you randomly pick. So the other one is just like somehow randomly. Random other point. And that follows from the symmetry, because this is symmetric. It's somehow whatever your first point is, it doesn't really matter. Because if I just pick these two, I could kind of symmetrically rotate until it's on the North Pole. Any other ideas? We've got a long way to go to solve this question. So if you have any ideas, please do the type in raise hand, because there are a lot of people inside this Zoom room. Aha. Is this Jack Liu? No problem. Coordinates. Coordinates. Are you meaning what, what kind of coordinates did you want to use? Ah. Uh, okay, that's okay. And when you said the distance, you're like distance is a Pythagorean theorem type thing. Is that what you mean? Distance is like. Yeah.
So that's a straight line distance. Okay, these are thoughts. Whenever you solve a problem at the beginning, we just collect a lot of ideas. Ale Alex, wait. Spherical coordinates. spherical coordinates. Can you remind us what those are? Okay, so it's phi theta and r. I, I, I think it might go like this, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, but can you remind us of what they are? Radius. What's this theta? Angle to the vertical. So I need to draw some kind of a picture, don't I? Hang on a second. Bear with me. Let's pretend that's a sphere. And so the theta you're telling me is the vertical angle, like this. And then the phi is presumably, there's some, I'm trying to draw a picture. Hopefully this makes sense. Like polar. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to attempt to draw this picture. It'll be hard to see. But that particular, the point is here, the, the pinkish purple thing. And the phi is like this angle. Are people with me? Is my picture sort of decipherable? It's like your, your theta is telling you how much down from the North Pole you're going, and the, the phi, you have to decide what the East Pole is. It's funny, the, this, the Earth doesn't have an East Pole, but you, know, you sort of go like, yeah, that direction, maybe the x-axis, and, and then you go kind of some angle, and that will tell you the phi. And the r is you know, how far it is along that eventual line. I guess the r is this. could be useful. Gee, does anyone know the spherical coordinates distance formula? We know the coordinates, we know the formula for, you know, x, y, z, x1, y1, z1 to x2, y2, z2. I can tell you how far apart they are. Does anyone know how far apart r1, theta1, phi1 is from r2, theta2, phi2? We might have to think about that. Okay, but I see there's another hat. So we have Simon, Simon, you? Hmm. Talking spherical coordinates, all the points along the same theta will have the same distance. Okay. Same theta have the same distance from the North Pole. That's true. So those are like this, oh, like this, like this Arctic circle or something. Okay. More ideas. Ah, oh, we have ideas here. I see there's another idea of Rajiv. Rajiv? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Okay, we could turn this with some huge trigonometry into x, y, z. And here's what I'll say. Whenever I do a problem, when I'm trying to solve a problem, I'll often write something like this to mean, let's not do that right now, but we know that if we wanted to, we could. It's just like we could find these formulas if we did want it to, if we wanted to, and let's see, let's see at what point we need to use them. Because sometimes it turns out like you don't need all of the formulas. Maybe you subtract something and a lot cancels. Meanwhile, we've got more ideas. Wow, Owen Lee, what do you have? Surface of the sphere. Okay, so yeah, so R is like fixed to the one. So we with our single function where we take theta and phi as the input and we like the distance between the two points as an output. So if we uh, like if we integrate the uh, this function, like integrate like um with the variable of theta and phi and integrate the value of the average distance, then divide the entire the entire equation by the um, surface area of the sphere. Okay. Okay, I'm going to write that down. Right, so then this distance. Does that sort of make sense what I've just written here? You're sort of integrating over all the thetas and phis that you could possibly have uh, of this particular distance to the North Pole. 
that's a, to the North Pole and divide by the surface area. That's the notion of average, right? When we do in Calc BC, the average value of a function, maybe let's just do a reminder, right? We know that the average value of f between a and b is you integrate from a to b f of x dx and you divide by b minus a let's pretend let's pretend that a is less than b that's actually going to be useful or else you get a negative number so okay that's true oh you know what actually it's okay it's okay even if a is the other way because then the integral is negative so actually this is correct this is correct no matter what okay meanwhile there were a whole bunch of other hands let's see if we can get more ideas here um i see i'm trying to read closely uh is it Mozi Lu? Uh, yeah, Mozi. Uh, hi. Uh, so I think this is related to Simon's idea, but um, I think if you just take a like a sphere from or like a, just a circle from the sphere, uh, you could just calculate the average distance from that because you can like rotate the rotate that around and then it'll work for the entire circle or sorry entire sphere. Are you trying to say like you want to do it for almost two dimensions and then do kind of this? So you're like, the North Pole is up here, and you want to solve the 2D version of the problem and just say it's the same answer? Yeah, I think, it, um, I'm thinking that might work. OK, let me write that idea too. OK, there's another idea, which is do the 2D version, which is like this. And OK, there's an N on top. And then you rotate. You rotate it like this. And it's the same answer. Okay, that's a thought. I want to go through a few more thoughts and then we'll, we'll soon be able to drive on one. Tony Yu? Tony Yu? Um, my idea is like, can't you just fix one, like, a point out of one of the poles so you have like easy numbers to work with and then do integration that way to calculate like the average distance? Okay, so what do you mean by integration that way? What do you want to integrate over? I haven't thought this much in the future. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. You're basically like just integrate some integral over the distance function. So like some, something like this, I wrote a big square root, divided by, I guess, the surface area. That's an idea. Let's keep getting more ideas. Wow, we're getting more ideas faster than I can call on people. Sophia Young? I'm not sure if this is right, but I was just imagining it. If we fix a point and then draw a line to every single point from the, from the sphere, wouldn't that be the volume of the sphere? Oh, that is true. So if I took a point, and I kind of drew all these lines. Some of them go, I'm drawing these. These are like to the front of the sphere or something. So it's like all the lines gives you the volume of the sphere. It does fill out the whole sphere. That is true. Maybe that's useful. That's actually, that's actually pretty interesting. Wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> this is very interesting. I wasn't thinking of doing this. I'm going to interrupt the chain of comments right now. I know that I, we were, I was sort of going through, but I'm actually kind of interested in what you've just done here. All lines, volume, of sphere. Does anyone else want to make a comment on this, of like what one might want to do next? This is actually very interesting. Okay, so let's let's get some ideas. So so I, I mean, by the way, I'm going to just uh, be like I don't know where those ideas were adding new things. I want to start now and be like, is there a new idea that builds off of this? Actually, Adavit Nini, uh, would that integral just be the volume of this sphere? <laughs> so that's what we're wondering, right? So if this thing over here is like these distances. Are, are people sort of following what's going on? This is like these distances divided by the surface area. Well, if you're integrating over all these distances, then those are like all these lines which are sticking out. And if you add them all up, that should make the volume of the sphere according to 9 and 10. This is really slick. This is very interesting. So basically between 9 and 10, what you're doing is you're finding all of these distances, okay? And that's actually going to be that the numerator is just the volume of the sphere divided by the surface area. OK. OK, question, question, question. So OK, why is 10 true? Let, let's, let's, let, let's, let, let's go deeper into this, all right? Because actually, I'm going to say, when you made that comment, number 10, I was like, oh, that's never going to work. 
th th what is this nonsense? And then, and then a moment later, I was like, this is actually pretty darn interesting. So let's let everyone understand why is 10 true. Apparently, not everyone believes 10. And so I would like to ask, does anyone else want to explain what the deal is with 10? Uh, of course, I can explain it, but it's better if it's clear that other people are getting this too. Who wants to make some comment about what's going on with this 10? Because obviously, it's not obvious to everyone here. Just feel free to type raise hand. Feebly raising hand, go for it, Tony, what do you think? Um, so I remember from from like services of revolution that like it's basically like if you stack infinite like infinitely many infinitely thin circles. <laughs> on top of each other and you get a volume. So it's basically just covering all of the infinitely thin circles if you draw lines, because it's a set of all the points inside of the sphere. So like, you're just translating that into circles. Yeah, so, so it's, that's a good way of thinking of it, right? It's like when you draw all these infinitely many infinitesimally thin things. Isn't that how integrals work? Like if you think about what an integral is, an integral is like the, and we're going to take an aside and dive into this. I want to make it clear, right? So if I drew like, you know, what's an integral? Integral is an area under a curve, right? If I draw this thing. But how do you figure that out? Well, in the easiest way to, th not the easiest way, sort of like the most naive way to think about it is, look, I just drew all these needles, toothpicks. Does that make sense? I just draw like all these toothpicks and I stick them up and I sort of add up the lengths of the toothpicks. But that's not quite right because there's infinitely many toothpicks. So this is what brings in the notion of a Riemann sum. A Riemann sum is there's no such thing as a sum of infinitely many things, each of which is zero. Like, what is that? That's nonsense. But what you do is you have like, they're very thin and there's obviously a lot of them. And you take a limit as like the thinness gets to zero, right? So when you do the area under the curve, the area under the curve is basically the sum of these very thin needles areas where I have more and more of them every time, but each time each one is less area. And so this thing about the sphere and the North Pole, it's like from the North Pole, if you were standing on the North Pole, you could dig a tunnel to every other point in the Earth. And those are like your needles. We'll still get into this a bit more. I see a bunch of raised hands. I want to, I want to let us get this. That was a good explanation. Alex Tsui, did you want to ask something or say something? We do think, thinking over you know, math memory, we kind of get weird because we're counting the end, top, north, pole, infinitely many times. But we're only counting the points of the sphere one time, or the line is the time. If we think of the physics way, so n is the highest force, and then by adding up all the rays, we're finding the divergence to the sphere. And that, that just should be the volume. OK. So that's another way to think of it. It's like it's, it's actually ray tracing all of those video games. <laughs> that's actually how all 3D video games work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Okay, so let's, let's, let's keep thinking about this. So, <laughs> meanwhile, I, I, I see that some people are, are commenting that... Wait a second, something is funny here. Ah, this is actually really funny. Okay, okay, okay. So I, I, like, I like where this is going. This is actually going very well, because we're, we're finding out that something is weird. Okay, and, and actually, I know how to fix this, I think. Do I know how to fix this? Maybe I don't know how to, oh no, maybe this won't work. Let's find out. So I see that there's a few, a few comments. I'm already going to, I, I want to say, um, does Adavit want to comment his comment? Because this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, okay, so I sent a private one. Um, if you just do the straight double integral of the distance and divide by the surface area, you get a different answer than when you do the volume of the sphere divided by the surface area. So like something's funny. So what you're saying is, let's even figure this out. What is the volume of the sphere? That's 4 thirds pi, four -thirds pi. r cubed, r is 1. There's no, there's no r. Uh, I mean r is 1. Okay, r is 1. 4 pi, r squared, and so this is 1 third. 
Okay. However, if you actually were to do the double integral, you don't get one third. You get four thirds. What do you mean by do the double integral? So, so like, remember how before, like, if you could go to the previous page of ideas, um, the average value thing of the double integral of distance to north pole over surface area was idea six. If you were to, like, actually calculate out the integral, Aha. Uh -huh. So now something is fishy. Uh, yeah, this is fishy because actually there's also a question of what does it mean average? Because I'm even going to say the theta phi, at this point I'm going to say the theta phi average is not even the right average to look at. There's a reason why. It's because in the theta phi averaging, if you're going to average it where every theta and phi is somehow equal, in the sense that, for example, when theta is near zero, each of the phi's is still worth something. Well, if you think about what's happening near zero, that's like you're, you're at the North Pole. If you imagine it, each of these circles has a different circumference even. Does this make sense, what I'm saying here? If you have a particular value of theta, which is close to zero, then you're only talking about points very close to the North Pole. If your theta is close to, one, uh, is close to pi, you're talking about points close to the South Pole. And if your theta happens to be like pi over two, suddenly like there's all these points. So there's something about the weighting here that's a little bit unfair. And actually here, you know, going back to this thing, there's a question of whether we actually have that all of these points are given the volume of the sphere. OK, actually, wait, now, now I take back what I said about this thing looks like it's correct. Um, it's tricky. What I'm going to say is this is very tricky. Because there's the, there's a problem with the physics approach is like, but how thick are those anyway? Like, how thick are those lines? And in particular, the reason why this is fishy is because, well, we are going to get lots of different answers. But I'm even going to say, what exactly is, oh, oh, I know what to do. I know that there were some hands, but I'm going to go and I'm going to take an aside. And I'm going to ask a completely separate question first. And we'll get back to this, and we'll soon see why I asked this question. Here's a random question, and this is where we'll find something that's very funny. Hey, let's not ask about the distance between two points in a sphere. What's the radius of a unit sphere? OK, this may look like a rhetorical question, but watch me do this problem in the most ridiculous way in the world. I will draw you a sphere, and I'll use the idea we just had. And I'm going to take the center of the sphere. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a lot of these things. Does this make sense? I'm going to draw all of the lines from the, from the center of the sphere out. It's even easier than the idea of like a light source. I've got a light bulb in the middle. And so it's just equal to the average length of a line, which we just found out was something like the double integral, right? It's the double integral of the length of, actually not just the line, average length of a radius which is the double integral of the length of a radius divided by the surface area. And that's equal to just the volume of the sphere divided by the surface area, which we just figured out. That was 4 thirds pi over 4 pi, which is 1 third. How many people like my proof that the radius of a unit sphere is 1 third? There's a problem. Okay, now let's go and see, see, see what's wrong with this. Okay, raise hands, raise hands. Aha! So I see some people asking me, like, does this have something to do with the Banach-Tarski paradox? It doesn't go that far, but let's get some raised hands. What's wrong with this? Jason Huang. Yeah, so one of the things I was skeptical about in, like, the original idea was that, like, I don't know if it applies here, but when you're finding the uh, integral of, like, a polar curve, you don't just take all the radii, you... Like one half oh no! <laughs> yes. Not just summing up all the radii. What you just said is somehow like what is this? The 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 d a, is this like one? I already forgot this stuff. Is it this? No, no, it's not that. Is it? Yeah, it is. Oh, it is. Is it one half r squared or is it one half r? R squared. R squared. Yeah. R squared. Something like this. Hmm. 
Is it off by a sign somewhere, you're saying? Ah, but uh, he's, so he's doing this thing with like normal polar, right? So this is like 2D polar. Okay, but you're right. Uh, and if you're doing spherical, especially if you're an engineer or a physicist and you know this stuff fast, there's like something else that you have to deal with with the phi. So the point is there's this pesky one half. Why is there a one half? Well, actually the reason there's a one half is the same reason there's a one third here. So actually this thing is... The, the problem with this is, and that's what, that's what calculus, that's what's interesting about calculus. Calculus is not just like, well, I can just take some, sti some sticks. You have to think about exactly what does it mean. That's why, I, that's why we started talking about the Riemann integral just a moment ago. We got some hands raised. Jay Parkhouse. I was wondering, what if, we, if, they, if all these sticks had any thickness, would they be overlapping with each other? Yes. So the thing is that, what exactly is an integral anyway? Right? If you wanted to ask, like, how, how are we getting this in double integral of length of radius becoming suddenly a surface area, right? Well, what you're really doing is if you're taking all these sticks and you thought of them as legitimate sticks, actually something we talked about earlier is you're kind of hitting the center infinitely often. So really, you shouldn't be using sticks. And you see, this is why and every, anytime anyone's uncomfortable about like, what's going on with calculus, the easiest way to think about it is, can we write a finite sum and then think of that as a limit? Actually, how can we resolve sticks? Uh, maybe, maybe people have an idea. I don't want sticks. Uh, raise hand, Matt Kern. Uh, like a, a pyramid, yes. So actually what you want to do here, for the sphere example of the bogus radius of the sphere thing I just did, actually what you want to do is you don't want to have just sticks. I'm going to do a bad job of drawing this. Of course, we're going to do this thing where you imagine that you're eventually going to take a limit and do things when there's like lots of little parts. But I'm trying to draw a giant, like, I don't know if this thing makes sense to you guys. This is a giant disco ball. Okay, so this is a giant disco ball. So uh, I'm, I'm saying that somehow my, my sphere, my sphere is basically all of these tiny little mirrors. And eventually, I'll have more and more tiny little mirrors. But they're going to cover the surface of the sphere. And what I'll do is from the center of the sphere, I will be doing things like this. Does that make sense? So I've basically said I'm going to take my entire volume of the sphere. And the volume of the sphere at this picture is very clearly approximately the sum of all of these pyramidal volumes. Okay, so what I'm going to say is that the volume of the sphere, actually what I'm talking about here is the ratio of the volume of the sphere and the sum of all of these pyramids, that ratio goes to 1. Okay, I'm going to write an approximate here, but what I really mean is that both sides, the ratio tends to 1 as more mirrors on the disco ball. The mirrors are like these tiny little, like tiny little squares. So this is about equal to the sum of the pyramids. OK. Actually, I see that there might be some hands raised. Uh, did Michelle Yue want to ask something? So I just had an idea for um, how to solve like the weighting of the points. Mm. So, like, going back to, like, using, like, fixing one point and having, like, the North Pole, I was thinking we could integrate in, like, rings um, that are, like, around the pole. You mean like these? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that will solve the problem. <laughs> so we'll go there. So let me let me ask, could you please hold your thought because we're going to use that to solve the whole problem uh, and we'll, we'll come back to your idea. That's actually the way to solve the problem. And... In order to kind of understand how all those things work, I want to come back over here and talk a little bit about, you know, how come, how can we be off by some factor, right? Like, how can we have this weird one third? And where does the one third come from? Okay, I see Jay Parkhouse also wanted to say something. Sorry, I think I, think I already. Uh, oh, okay, no problem, no problem. But now that I've written that this is sum of pyramid volumes, does anyone know? why there's a mysterious one-third here? What does the one-third have to do 
with this notion that we shouldn't be using sticks, but we should be using pyramids. Okay, Simon. Exactly. It's because for the pyramids, the volume is actually one-third base times height. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you how, you know, you actually would write this out if you were using sums and then thinking about integrals, right? What exactly is the sum of these pyramid volumes? Well, you see, those were my sticks, right? These were the things that I was imagining was a stick. But imagine that the stick just went to the... Imagine that this... Yeah, that's how you make a disco ball. You put mirrors tangent to the surface. I assume that's what you do. You, you, you get a, I assume you get some kind of a ball, and then you go and stick some mirrors, and the mirrors are tangent to the surface, and the center of the mirror is like where it touches the sphere. You know what I mean? And if that was the case, the sum of the pyramid volumes, what I have over here, is just the big sum of, uh, well, it will be these little areas, right? So it's one-third times the area. Let's give the area, let's call it like AI or something. This would be the area of this particular mirror, right? AI, one-third base area times height. But the height is like that particular radius. I'll call it RI. I'm calling it RI even though all of the radii are the same, but I'm emphasizing that you were thinking of it as that was that stick, and that was that stick, and that was that stick. So if I have this, then uh, in, in, in what I was doing here when I said like, okay, what's the average value of the radius? What does this have to do with anything? Well. This is actually a weighted sum. You see, because if I wanted to know what's the sum of these pyramid volumes, oh sorry, what if I wanted to know, what, what if I wanted to know what's the weighted sum of the radii? Because that's actually what I want to know here. Maybe let me let me take a step back. The average radius is equal to the weighted average of Ri's weighted by AIs. I actually want to make sure we can dwell on this sentence first. What does it mean weighted average? Well, the reason is because in our example here, the mirrors aren't all perfectly the same area either. There's no way to cover a sphere with like perfect squares everywhere. Some of the mirrors will be slightly smaller, some will be slightly bigger. And so I want to do what's called a weighted average, where I say, you know, but so that was a nice radius you got there, but the, radi but the area was kind of smaller, so that's not worth as much. Oh yeah, it's election year. That's the best example. <laughs> the weighted average is like if you wanted to like average the number of, okay, that's if you wanted a popular vote by weighted average of how many votes you got in various districts or something. I'm not sure if that was even a correct analogy. But I'm just trying to emphasize that somehow if it's a bigger piece, it should be weighted more. Can someone tell me what's the formula for the weighted average of some numbers weighted by these weights? There's no integral for this. I just want to know, if I wrote down for you, I want a weighted average of Ri's. The weight of each Ri is an Ai. What is the formula for that? It's, a, it's something in terms of the Ri's and the Ai's, and there's no integral. Jack. Yep. So you basically weight each of the R's. I won't use the sigma notation because I just want to let people see a pattern, right? You just weight all of them. Oh, no, how many are there? I guess there are n. There's always n, OK? And then you divide by the sum of all the weights. And the reason why this is what you do for a weighted average is because if you look at it, then the coefficient of each Ri is some fraction. A1 divided by blah, A2 divided by blah, and AN divided by blah. And the sum of all of those weights adds up to 1. And it's also like how you average things if you were doing like chemistry and mixing things. Uh, it's all the standard idea. Like if you go and mix something and you use like two parts something and one part another thing, then the way you weight it, average it, is you go two thirds times the first value plus one third times the second value. That's what's going on here. Why did I go through all that trouble? The reason I went through all that trouble is now we can see how this has to do with volume divided by surface area. Can anyone help bring me home and explain how to fix the factor of 3 in my bogus proof? I have this bogus proof that the radius of the unit sphere is 1 third. And over here, I've just found out that you know the, the, the sum of the pyramid volumes is 1 third times the AI RI. And what I really care about is what is the average radius, which is this weighted average, which is this guy. 
what does this thing have to do with surface areas and volumes? Sana. Good. So the denominator is the surface area because it's the sum of all of these things, right? So the denominator is, here's what I'm going to call the denominator. I'm going to call it the approximate surface area. And the reason I write approximate is because we're adding up these, um, these mirrors. But you can see that as you have more and more mirrors and they're smaller, it approaches this. Next. And also the numerator, you can replace what you wrote on top. Yeah, that sigma, you could like take the one third out and then log it back in to the second equation. Good. So the important thing is that this part, the summation and the AIRI, is the top of this. So what that means is that this sum of AIRIs is exactly three times the volume. Well, three times the approximate volume. Now you're in good shape, because now if we did that, we should actually take times 3. And if you remember, the volume divided by the surface area, that was 1 third, and now times the 3, you get 1. So this is, I'll write 1. Okay, I'm going to write it, mm, I don't like to write an equal sign. I'll write tens to 1 as you have more and more mirrors. Right? This tens to 1 is as you have more, than more, more and more mirrors. Well, strictly speaking, it tends to 3 times 1 third because that was the actual volume divided by the surface area. So that's how this thing works. Are there any questions about this, like, this particular way of handling this uh, paradox that we've just dealt with? Question. Erica Chia. Um, I was wondering, so like, I understand the whole thing with the pyramid, but at the bottom when we say like three times volume and we just plug the one third in there, are we just saying that because like, that's what it should be, or are we deriving mm. that from somewhere? Okay, so, <laughs> so here's, here's two things. First of all, I wrote these approximately signs, and then I write an, an arrow. And that's why up there I was kind of specific. I said the approximately sign means that the ratio of these two quantities tends to 1. So as I get more and more mirrors, whatever I'm getting on the right-hand side is, as a ratio compared to this, the ratio is approximately 1. And because I'm dividing things, that's why I care about ratios. So for example, even though over here I got some, some equal sign, it's this thing, over here I can say as n goes to infinity, as you get more and more of these mirrors, in fact the ratio gets closer and closer to three times the volume of the actual sphere divided by the surface area of the actual sphere. Okay, so if I want to be specific, let's do it slowly. So what I actually get is it goes as an arrow to three times the volume of a sphere and these are of sphere, and these are of sphere, divided by the actual surface area of the sphere. Okay? So what I have over here now is I've replaced it by the arrow is only meaning the same thing the arrow does is the same notion as what happens when you have the Riemann sum, and it gets closer and closer to the actual legitimate integral. That's how I'm... Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just saying. This makes sense. And then the next thing is, wait a second, where did the one-third come from? Well, that came from us already knowing that the volume of the sphere is four-thirds pi, right? And in this particular class, we won't have time to prove that particular piece. However, I just wanted to say, that would be, that would be another topic, right? Another topic of how, how do you get the volume of a sphere, which itself is really interesting, but we just won't do today. But now I'm going to write from that, that equals, and I can just do three times four-thirds pi divided by four pi, and that equals one. So the only arrow, the only limit is happening when I'm saying that I'm taking all these mirrors and they're getting smaller. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. In general, if people have questions, I'm sure that other people have, this, have similar questions. So this resolves the paradox. And now if we go back, now you can see why, at first I actually, I also got fooled. I thought this would be fine. I thought this would be fine. Why does it break here? If I try to think about what was going on, why is it any different here? Because the answer to this question is actually not one third. So why is it not okay here? Like, should I just take another one-third in and make the answer to be one? What's different here? Notice what I have over here in the disco ball. In this disco ball, I have this picture. I'm going to draw a new picture, and then maybe we can dwell on that. Why can't I just do the same thing I just did? New disco ball. 
I'm lazy, so I'm going to draw some big pieces, okay? And in general, I've got some piece. Here's a piece. Why can't I just go like north pole? Whoa, that wasn't a straight line. North pole to this. Why can't I just say like there was some distance? Oh, one more line. It's going to be hard to read. But there's a distance here. Distance. And there's an area here. Why can't I do the same kind of thing? What's broken now? Jack Parkhouse. I think it's because it's no longer a pyramid. Like yes. Yeah. Well, it is a pyramid, well, it's but no it's weird. Yeah. It's like the base and the height isn't the height. Does this make sense to people? The problem here is that you have your base of your pyramid, AI, but no longer is it that your height is going up. Your height's doing something like this. Does this make sense? That's the problem. Maybe I'll just do this, and I'll say, this is not the height. The important, the important thing with the previous thing that we did was that it actually went perpendicular into the center of the base. So actually, that's why this, one, this one's misleading. It, you actually can't just get away with this, because it won't even work that well. We can't, we can't make this work. The reason we can't make this work is because it's a different angle every time. If I'm going all the way down to the disco ball bottom thing, it's right angle, and then I'll do like, the correct thing. If you're thinking about what's going on here, you basically have to take into account like, some trigonometric function. It's like, what's the angle that this has, which would be hard. So because we're running low on time, I want to then just run back around to an idea that was raised, which is like a way to actually solve this problem, which is to go back to this and say, you know, let's go back to this weighted average idea again. What if what we did is we took the weighted average and we want to just find out what is the, um, yeah, what is the weighted average of all these distances? So let's do it. Let's, let's go and take a look. And we want to do it sort of ring by ring. But again, we should be a little bit careful. We can't really do ring by ring because we have to be careful of adding infinitely many things. You can't add infinitely many things which are zero. We can only add finitely many things and then let the number that things we're adding get bigger and bigger. So what would be the natural thing to do? Actually, let's bring everyone else onto this now. We can't add circles. Circles is like, you can't make a, they, they have zero. They have zero in some sense. I need something with, with actual area. OK, Erica, Erica Xiang. So you integrate over theta, and like with each theta, you would get like a little strip of basically at each level, I guess? Yes. Um, so. Let's draw that. So what you're saying is that, all right, I've got this thing. And you're already thinking ahead. I'm going to do some integral over theta. I'm going to do some d theta. And so you're going to kind of go along here. And you know, there's something. This is some angle you're playing with. This is already your theta. And you're already thinking of it as a d theta. The d theta is a way of thinking that it's a small change in theta. Okay. I'm just going to write a d theta under here, emphasizing that that's the little bit inside. And now you're trying to imagine what is that. And you know, we can even say, when we think of disco balls, this one's not really disco balls. This one is like a, something like this, where it's just kind of going all the way around. And the important thing is when I draw something like this, oops. When I draw something like this going all the way around, the important thing is that the distance from the North Pole is actually the same for every one of these. Well, when I say the same, it's close. The distance from the North Pole to each one of the points on this uh, shellish thing, those are all about the same. And this is where I'm going back to this thing of like the ratio between it and the true value is tending to 1. Because as my shell gets thinner and thinner, then if this was like 0.4 in truth, maybe you have an error of up to 0.39, up to 0.41. But then go and make things thinner and thinner. And if, if it's 0.4 in truth, suddenly it's 0.399 to 0.401. And you're getting more and more precise. OK? So that's what I want to add over. So instead, what I need to do then is I'll, I'll, give, a, I'll give some new areas, right? The new area that I'm going to play with is AI is the area not of a disco ball thing, but the area of this thing. 
the area of this thing. And of course, that's the weight. That's the weight. And you have this actual di. What is di? Let's work out di first. And I should write an approximate, because this is only true um, in the sense that there's some flex in whether it goes to here or goes to there, but that ratio of what is the truth compared to what we actually calculate is going to tend to 1. Is there a nice formula I can use for the di? Jack Liu? Oh, AI. Go for AI. Okay, yeah, so, so we're like, uh, okay, r is 1. That's going to make our life easier, okay? r is 1, and if r is 1, I think what you wanted to figure out is, what is this thing? Is that right? Right. I think that's sign, but that's not a big deal. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is, this is silly stuff at this point. So this thing here is sine theta, and then so you're like, what is the, what is the area of this thing, of this strip? And this area of the strip is about uh, 2 pi times the radius. And, you know, we all call it d theta because d theta is the, is the width of the strip, actually. Um, we can go ahead and write that, right? And, you know, are you, are you exactly right? Well, this is, again, off by maybe a factor of a multiplicative factor that tends to 1 in the sense that if you actually try to make this strip, if you try to make it, it is kind of, it is tilted out a little bit but the error you have is only at the very tip at the end. If you try to take a, a piece of paper and kind of put it around here, do you know what I mean? It's like it, it kind of expands out. I'm, I'm basically saying that the, the circle at the top and the circle at the bottom are slightly different. But if you try to imagine them, you'd basically have a rectangle that becomes like a trapezoidish thing. But the bulk of the area is actually measured in this way. We're always thinking of what's the, what's the, what's the main term is what we're measuring here. So now if that's, the, if that's the area of this piece, what's the di? That's the only other thing I have to get. OK, I see. I'm trying to read. Is it Raid? Raid Tanvir? Uh, yes. Uh, I would say it's half r squared sine theta. Half r squared sine theta. Um, where are you getting that one from? Let's just see. Oh, oh sorry. No, no. I, I have to use the cosine rule. Sorry. No, so it's OK. I'm going to draw it this way. It's a, it's a zoomed in picture. I've got a theta, and the radiuses are 1. And all I care about is that thing. What's a good way to hit this one? Rajiv? Uh, yeah, so I think you could break it down into a sort of like an x distance and a y distance. You can. I want to save some time. You can do it in, you can do it in trig. I, I, you, that would work too. I'm just like, we only have two minutes left. So there's a way to do this trig wise. Is it Jack Liu? Do you have a way? Yeah, let's cut it in half. So if you cut it in half, each one of them becomes theta over 2. And if each one of them becomes theta over 2, now you have that. The radius is 1, right? So this thing here is just sine of theta over 2, and you have two of them. Okay? So now we suddenly have what we want. So the di is 2 sine theta over 2. Okay? So then, how do I put everything together? We have all the key components now. Can anyone tell me what the answer would be in terms of like something we need to integrate and divide? Ah, Sana, Imani. Um, the answer is going to answer the Ah, OK. No problem, no problem. Anyone want to answer what we should do now? We have, a, we have an estimate for the DI. We have a, the, the area we're trying to do. So now if I want to know the average, what do I do? Jack. So just returning when we talk about weighted average, right? we're doing AI by DI, so we integrate that. So integrate 2 by sine theta. So we take, yeah. So you're basically, I'm going to take the, the A part, 2 pi. Let's use green, since it was green. We take the 2 pi sine theta. I'm even going to write the d theta with it. That's the green part. And you multiply it by the pinkish purple part. 
And what are the limits of integration? 0 to pi over here? Because that's what the, that's what the theta does. It goes from 0 all the way down to pi. And then I have to divide by. What do I divide by? Integral of the green part. Integral of green part. Not just the area. Yep. And by the way, the good news is that the integral of the green part is actually the surface area. That's how you can double check your work to make sure you didn't screw up. If you check what the bottom is, the bottom is actually equal to 4 pi. OK, and that, that should be, because that's the surface area. <laughs> if you add up all of these AIs, you better get the surface area. If you don't get the surface area, something's wrong. And then on top, we just have to do the top. Oh no, how do you do the top? This is, this is, this is bringing back calculus memories. It's one of these trigonometric things. I, on the top, let's just do this. On the top, what do I have? I have an integral. Let's take out the twos. I have a 4 integral 0 to pi of, I have a sine theta sine theta over 2, d theta. Hmm. Who likes doing these? Oh, someone knows how to do these. Uh, Simon, are you raising your hand again? So I was raising your hand for last oh. time, but I suppose we can split the uh, theta in half here. You split the what? If we, uh, so I'm actually not too sure about it. My intuition is that we can split the theta into so we treat it as uh, loosely half angle formula, basically. Do you mean the double angle formula or the half angle formula? Do you want to break this guy? Uh, I so I, I'm scared of going the other way, because if I go from the sine theta over 2 and I want to get the sine theta thing, there's like a square root involved. I think we should probably break the theta. Yeah, let's break the theta, right? So then this is equal to 4 integral 0 to pi of 2 sine theta over 2 cos theta over 2 sine theta over 2 d theta. This is actually good. This is one of these classic calculus type problems. Um, again, because we're over time, I'm just going to say there's a substitution. Can someone tell me a good substitution to use? Raise hand, Jack Parkhouse. Well, I think that, like the idea is that the sine pi over two is just square, and so then you could use cosine pi over two as the u. Okay, you want to use u is equal to cosine theta over two. Can I do that? Actually, you know what? I'm going to go the other way, and only because I, I'm trying to save time, and I don't I, I I don't remember this one fresh. But the reason I want to use cos uh, use sine is because if I do the du, what am I going to get? Then I don't have a negative sign. Do you see what I mean? So I'm just going to make a suggestion that we use u to be sine. So this is u, and this is u, and the other part is the du. No, I missed a half. Half. Okay, so there's an extra half here. And the du is going to come from here. Oh, I need to get a half. How do I get a half? I get a half by like just throwing another half in there. But I have to make up for it by multiplying it by a 2. Does this make sense? I'm just like, I'm just, I, I, I multiplied by 1. That's all I did here. Times a half times a 2. And now once I've got this, I can write down what the actual integral is. Going back, then I get an integral of, well, I've got 16 now, 4, 2, and 2. So I've got 16. Integral, instead of 0 to pi, since my u is sine theta over 2, I go from sine 0 to sine pi over 2. That's good. That's from 0 to 1. Of simply u squared du. Wait, I lost a pi somewhere. Oh no, it's, it was not, there's, there's a pi missing in the whole thing. Help, there's a 4 pi there, there's a 4 pi there, and there's a 16 pi here. I missed, I missed one of the pi's uh, inside, this, inside this expression. There was, a pi, there was a pi that was supposed to fly up. But now we're good. Because if you integrate this, uh, the integral from 0 to 1 of u squared, that's 1 third u cubed. And if you plug it in, you just get 1 third. And so this is 16 pi over 3. And finally, if you divide them, if you take the 16 pi over 3 and divide by the 4 pi, you get the answer. And 16 pi over 3 divided by 4 pi turns out to be 4 thirds. 
So that's actually the answer to this question. Uh, and it's interesting to, to do this question because you get lots of different answers. Like we saw an answer that could have been, I don't know, when we were doing it with different ways, we found different kinds of answers. This one's actually legitimate because we went and did it carefully. Sorry we're over time, but thanks to everyone for your ideas. So class is officially done. If anyone has any particular questions that you want to ask, you're welcome to stick around. Uh, the YouTube audience I'm going to say goodbye to. Bye, guys. Uh, but I'm going to stay in this room to chat. Just a second.